Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for the organizers and especially Karin for inviting me to give this invited talk. So this talk is um, meant to be an introduction, so please ask if you have questions. Um, and just a brief word about myself. I actually um, did a PhD at the University of Bonn in ETH Zurich and I worked on multiphoric materials there, so this is the topic of my talk. And um, now I'm actually doing a postdoc in the group of Professor Laura Heidemann, um, working on artificial spin system, and she also will uh, present something about that in the next talk. But the topic of this talk will be multiferroics um, and magnetoelectric materials. And to give you an overview of just where we are going, I want to introduce ferroic and multiferroic materials. Um, I want to talk mainly about domains and domain boundaries, so I will also introduce this as well and then I will give you some examples of the um, work. So, uh, I know the, the title of this uh, conference is or workshop is topology matters but if we talk about ferroic materials we have to start with symmetry matters um, because the definition and classification of ferroic materials is based on symmetry arguments. So what is a ferroic uh, material or what is a ferroic phase transition? Um, that is actually a phase transition where we have some long-range order emerging in the material. So if you have this temperature, for example, if you look at <coughs> magnetic material, you have some kind of paramagnetic phase where you have random spins. And then below a certain critical temperature, um, you will get spontaneous long-range order, for example, where they couple ferromagnetically, all pointing in one direction. Um, and you can have two different possibilities to do so. so um, there are two different things that are important here. If we break the symmetry, we will get new emergent properties, tensor properties. So this is a relation to symmetry. And we get a formation of domains. So if we have the symmetry breaking, but we have the different domains, um, and this multi-domain state then looks again like the symmetry or has <coughs> the symmetry of the um, disordered state. And um, a ferroic phase of a ferroic um, material is actually then defined um, by the fact that you can switch between those different domains. Um, so that you have a, here are the different domains and you have a driving field and then you can switch between different orientations of your local order parameter by driving the domains with the field. Um, and there are different kinds of ferroic order. So for example, there are ferromagnets, that was the previous example, where you have your magnetic moments of the uh, ions aligning, you can drive them with a magnetic field. You have ferroelectric materials where you have a charge separation between positive and negative charges <coughs> in your material. You can drive those positive, so you have a polarization between those two charges and you can flip it with an applied electric field. And there are ferroelastic materials um, where you have a spontaneous strain, so you, on the transition, you change the um, the crystal class and then you get spontaneous um, uh, strain tensor components and then you can, if you apply a stress, you can switch between different strain states. Um, and those, those different properties are defined um, by the symmetry, so um, magnetic materials break time reversal, ferroelectric materials break, um, break um, inversion symmetry, so spatial inversion, and um, um, very elastic materials break rotational symmetries. And if we now want to talk about magnetoelectric effects and multiferroic effects, um, we, first of all, magnetoelectric is a cross control um, between um, electric and magnetic properties, like using an electric field to change magnetic properties of a material or using a magnetic field to change um, electric properties. Um, and multiferricity means that we have in the same phase or in the same material, different order parameters like a spontaneous magnetization and a spontaneous polarization. And maybe I should have mentioned before, ferroic materials are immensely important for technological applications. For example, ferromagnets are used in motors, transformers, um, and uh, memory you can... Device. Hmm? Memory devices. Memory devices, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> most important, no. Um, but one of the most important ferroelectrics are used also for sensors, um, also memory devices, um, piezoelectric devices. Um, 
So there are a lot of applications where not only the different domains are important, but also the um, increase of the um, course, uh, not coercivity, uh, the uh, susceptibilities that are related. So here you have a divergent susceptibility and this is um, important. Um, but why are we interested in magnetoelectric materials? Why are we interested in multifluoric materials? Um, the thing is, if we could manipulate, for example, magnetic order with an electric field, we could, um, so this is actually kind of the holy grail of multifluoric materials, that we would be able to switch fast and with low energy a magnetic material and that you can read it out by magnetic means. Um, so you have this, all the optimum combination of, of the optimum properties of the different materials. Um, one thing, uh, as it turns out, ferromagnetic ferroelectrics are actually quite difficult to make. Mm -hmm. So this was discovered by Nicolas Borden, then Hill, and described in this um, paper. So f conventional ferroelectrics uh, favor empty D shells. For ferromagnetism, you need unpaired spins, so they don't really like each other. And um, many of the multifluoric materials, the single phase multifluoric materials, are actually anti ferromagnetic, so where we have compensated spin order. And there are different ways to create multifluoric materials. So you can have materials where you have two different phase transition first, a ferroelectric phase transition, and then a magnetic phase transition. Um, and the most important example of this is bismuth ferrite. Um, and I guess we will hear uh, in a talk by Manuel more about bismuth ferrite later. The type 2 um, uh, multifluorics <coughs> relate to spin induced ferroelectrics, where you have actually a magnetic order, breaking inversion symmetry, and via some coupling to the lattice, um, inducing ferroelectricity. And there are artificial multifluorics, where you combine different materials with magnetic and electric properties um, to have a cross control. For example, via strain, where you have a um, pH electric material acting on a magnetostrictive material. And uh, Laura will give an introduction to this as well. And I hope. <laughs> Is it possible to say something very brief about why uh, empty deep ends yes. are necessary or um, for oh. feral electricity. Oh, okay, this is, oh, oh dear. <laughs> you can say no, I'll ask you Okay, <laughs> I, I, um, I should know, but it's, it's a little bit away. And I, 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 so I will talk in this, uh, in this talk, I will really talk about the type two ferroelectric, so this was never really a major um, concern for me. Um, exactly, so I will talk about spin-induced ferroelectrics and give the other um, speakers the opportunity to talk about the others <coughs> topics. Um, and one of the first uh, spin-induced ferroelectrics was terbiomanganite. Um, it's a magnetic material terbium. that's... Uh, TB, what's TB? TB, terbium. Terbium, rare earth terbium and plus manganite and it's an oxide. Um, you have a magnetic order, antiferromagnetic order emerging below 42 Kelvin and then around 30 Kelvin you have a second phase transition. Um, so first you have a sinusoidal spiral order and then you create this kind of cycloidal spiral. And this cycloidal spiral breaks inversion symmetry. And if you do pyroelectric current measurements, so what, what this means is if you have a polarization, um, you have charges on top and charges on, the, on the charges on the top, charges on the bottom. And if you change the polarization um, with temperature, so the polarization vector will change. And if you, you can measure then the current that flows between the two sides of the sample. And then you can integrate it back again to, uh, so the current that flows to measure the polarization independence of temperature. And what they found is, so the black curve is at zero temperature, that you have a spontaneous polarization emerging directly with the magnetic order um, along the C direction. And um, if you then apply a magnetic field, so across around five Tesla, you then have a, a spin flop transition. That is something very common in antiferromagnets where you um, apply a field um, perpendicular, no. So you apply a field and the, the moments flop by 90 degrees and what, as it turns out, also the polarization follows. 
Um, and this is directly related to the very close um, relationship between the spin order and the ferroelectric polarization. So what we have here is this cycloidal spiral. This uh, is a non-collinear spin um, structure that has a handedness. And due to the inverse jaloshinsky mori interaction, you can create a, a charge displacement. So we had the jaloshinsky mori interaction yesterday as well, where you have non-collinear moments um, um, creating a charge displacement. This is now the inverse. Or if you have something that a structure that breaks inversion symmetry, like surfaces, um, where you can then cant the magnetic moment. So it comes in both directions. And as you can, as the magnetic symmetry breaks, inversion symmetry in both kinds of domains, in left-handed and right-handed, um, so you can also get two polarization domains. Um, so this kind of multiferric order is usually found in um, frustrated um, uh, transition metal oxides. So this is quite common um, because in, in 3D, um, transition metal oxides, you have the right interplay between exchange interaction, anisotropy and crystal field interactions, um, where you actually can get quite interesting uh, magnetic order. Um, and this cycloidal spiral that comes in a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation is only one example of, of spin-induced um, ferroelectric um, ferro electricity. Um, but there are many different mechanisms, and they are actually described in these reviews. I don't want to go too much um, into this. But there are different mechanisms acting on, on bond angles, bond length, or orbital redistribution. Um, so again, like in this talk with, um, by Ming this morning about superconductivity, we have this very strong interplay between lattice, charge, orbital, and spin degrees of freedom. So this is the microscopic view. On a macroscopic scale, so we have this spin-induced um, magnetism, um, spin-induced ferroelectricity, sorry. Um, and if we apply a magnetic field, we already saw in the turbium manganite, we can change the magnetism and we can change the ferroelectricity. Um, so there are various examples. You see almost all of them are oxides. Um, and of course, it's not a complete list. But if you apply fields, there are materials where you can enhance the ferroelectric polarization or you can reduce the ferroelectric polarization so you're acting on the magnitude. There are some examples where you can actually flip the polarization from positive to negative with a magnetic field. And um, there are also materials where you can um, rotate the polarization either suddenly, like in turbium manganite by 90 degrees, or continuously. And later in the talk, I will um, discuss the cases of manganese germanite and cobalt manganese tungstate. Okay, this is a macroscopic view. We had the microscopic view, but I now want to go to the main topic or main focus of my talk, that is the mesoscopic view. So um, I want to talk about domains and domain walls. Okay, sorry, this is a bit cartoonish, but in ferroic uh, materials you have um, domains and the properties of domains matter. So it, it matters the domain size, the domain morphology, the domain dynamics and the coupling of the order parameter. So if you think about um, magnetic memory storage, you al always hear that you want denser magnetic storage, so their domain size might be relevant. Um, if you um, want to have fast switching, then of course it might be relevant how the domains switch. And in the case of multifluorics, we are especially interested how different domains um, relate. And this is quite an emergent field in the last years. Boundaries between ferroic domains also have very interesting properties. Um, first of all, um, ferroic material we can switch, so we have boundaries that we can create and move and destroy. Um, they are localized. They're usually relatively thin, like, like a few nanometers or up to a few nanometers in ferroelectrics and something like up to 100 nanometers in ferromagnets. Um, and they have interesting properties. So in, in ferroelastic materials, for example, you can create in thin films um, domain boundaries that have a different chemical environment than the bulk material. And in thin films, you actually can create a lot of uh, domain walls, such that you have something like 20 or 30 percent of the sample is domain wall and not even the, the bulk phase. Um, 
the symmetry of domains, so since you have to go from one kind of domain to the other domain, the symmetry will be reduced. And this can also lead to um, interesting properties, like for example, a magnetic domain wall can have an electric polarization, and this can be displaced by an electric field of a tip. This was uh, shown in this paper. Um, and also you can have strain components where you have a coupling between different domain walls. And they can also have um, interesting electronic properties like in, um, in bismuth ferrite where you have very electric um, domains and if you have them head to head or tail to tail um, you get a charge accumulation from the ionic charges at the domain wall and then the, um, the uh, electrons in the material try to screen this and this can enhance or reduce the conductivity with respect to bulk. So there are quite a, a lot of interesting properties also related to domain walls. Um, maybe you have seen something like this. So um, there is the so-called Kittel law that relates the domain size to the sample thickness. Um, so here you have the sample thickness in nanometers and the domain period in also in nanometers. And um, the morphology and the size of the domains in, in ferroelectrons, ferromagnets and ferroelastics is actually determined by the interplay between the volume energy and the um, wall energy. So if you have a ferromagnet, you have stray fields, and therefore it is more favorable for a material to break into different domains, to reduce the stray fields. But each domain wall has a certain cost, so your system will accumulate, uh, ac accommodate this kind of stray field energy versus wall energy and go into a domain state that somehow reflects this balance. And um, this is the Kittel law and gives this somehow kind of a square root dependence. And the morphology is also very nicely explained in this um, paper that is very interdisciplinary. Um, as you can see, it works nicely, but as I told in the beginning, I will talk about spin spiral ferroelectrics. Spin spiral materials are anti-ferromagnets. Um, and if we talk about anti-ferromagnetic domains, we actually have to be quite clear what kind of domains we're talking about. Um, because there can be different domains. Um, so there can be kind of translational domains where your um, propagation vector shows into different directions. There can be orientation domains where the, so maybe I, I can draw this. So here's something. So, so this would be kind of, an, oh, sorry. So orientational domains that has the same Q vector but different orientations of the moments. Um, <coughs> you can have chirality domains and you can have induced secondary order parameters. And depending on what technique you use, you <coughs> see different domains. And it's just as a reminder that you, that it's more complicated in antiferromagnets but you have more things that you can do with antiferromagnets. So that's also great. Um, antiferromagnets are a bit problematic to image because they have um, compensated spin order and they don't have stray fields to really image. Um, but there are a few techniques and uh, this is kind of an incomplete overview of possible techniques to, um, I'm not sure if it's very complete, but okay. <laughs> um, just to give you an idea of what techniques we have to find out on, on, um, on, on antiferromagnetic domains. And I, so the general consensus is antiferromagnetic domains are larger than magnetic, so ferromagnetic and ferroelectric domains because we don't have stray fields. Um, and I did a little scavenger hunt to try to find out what the domain sizes are and it's com not really complete. Um, and actually, um, I got this kind of, this two points that have comparable, so that were made from the same samples um, just to give a size impression. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's also kind of a relationship. And it makes it so, I, I mark this one micron scale. This is kind of the scale that is accessible with optical techniques. Okay. Um, I want to now go to the first example. Domain coupling in manganese germanite. Um, and this was done in collaboration with um, Manfred and Dennis and um, with um, Jonathan White and Michelle Kenselman from the Pauschera Institute and the samples we got from the um, Kimura group in Osaka. Uh, Kimura-san is now in Tokyo. 
Oh, okay. Okay, he's now in Tokyo. Sorry. So this was back then. It's back then. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Why are we interested in manganese germanite? <laughs> so, so manganese germanite is actually one of the rare examples where we have a ferromagnetic ferroelectric material. It's an orthorhombic crystal. It has a conical multiferric phase between six Kelvin. Uh, uh, between no, below six Kelvin. Sorry. Um, and it has a spin-induced polarization and a weak magnetization. And what is interesting is they're both along the C direction, and it's actually the only example of a spin-induced ferroelectric where polarization and magnetization are parallel. Um, and you see here, if you look at the magnitude, the values for polarization and magnetization are actually pretty small. But if we apply a magnetic field, we need something like 100 millitesla to switch the magnetization. And at the same time we switch the magnetization, we also switch the polarization. So it goes hand in hand. Um, so this is goes from, so if we have an, a, a positive P goes to negative P and the other way around. So we still have two polarization domains. They're not uniquely coupled to the magnetization, but we can flip back and forth um, with an applied magnetic field. And we wondered what the domains are doing. So what is the role of the domains? Um, and we used optical second harmonic generation to investigate this um, domain pattern. So optical second harmonic generation uses nonlinear optics to um, look at materials. And as I said before, we have, if we have a phase transition, we have a symmetry breaking. And SHG um, is especially sensitive to materials that break inversion symmetry. So if we have a ferroelectric material that breaks inversion symmetry, um, we get new contributions to this nonlinear tensor and we get a, a light signal so that we, we illuminate our sample with laser light and we get a simultaneous absorption of two photons and a direct re-emission of uh, a photon with twice the energy. So we look at, so we shine in infrared and get out blue, for example. And um, this tensor depends on the material symmetry, so we can use it to probe ferroic order. Um, and we have quite a number of optical degrees of freedom that we can change and as assess different tensor properties. We can use a CCD to image the sample. So these experiments were done in transmission and we have a spatial resolution down to about one micron. Um, and then we can also um, change the sample environment, changing temperature, magnetic and electric field. And the domains, if we image them with a CCD camera, they will either show up with a contrast at the domain boundary or with different brightness, depending on the experimental situation. Okay, so uh, second harmonic generation done on manganese germanite. Um, here is the um, independence of temperature, plot of the second harmonic intensity, and as you see, it's kind of constant and almost zero um, above this critical temperature, and then below we get a jump like increase of the intensity because we have a first order transition and this is the phase where we have both the spontaneous magnetization and polarization. <coughs> if you use a second harmonic um, light to image the sample, um, in zero field cooling we get a multi-domain state. Um, so here we you see different brightness and different um, positions of the sample and then if we apply a strong enough electrical field we can drive it into single domain state um, and this white outline is the overlap between the front and the back electrode of the sample. Um, and this also tells us that we are coupling to the ferroelectric order parameter. So we are imaging ferroelectric domains using second harmonic generation. Okay, so what about the magnetic field? So um, this is now, again, domain images of manganese germanite. We are now looking at on the BC plane, the polarization points either left or right. And to show what the polarization in the different domains are doing, I colored them blue and yellow, respectively. And here you see the domain state um, at a certain, at 150 millitesla. And if we go to minus 150 millitesla, we are, you actually see that every one of the yellow domains got blue, and of the blue domains got yellow. So we have a change of the polarity of the spontaneous polarization. Um, what you also see there is that these domain walls that are a little bit rugged here in this image um, get straightened out. But then if we 
do the same thing again. So we go at first to zero field, and there the domain state stays like it is. And then we reverse the field, and again we go from a blue domain to a yellow domain, and from a yellow domain to a blue domain. So we kind of reproduce the, the measurements that were done on a macroscopic scale, applying a magnetic field going from positive to negative domains and from negative to positive polarity, also on the mesoscopic scale. And um, we try to find out what is actually happening between the switching. So during the switching, this is kind of the endpoints at the um, far away from this kind of reversal. Um, and for this, uh, we, we imaged a different uh, phase, again, with increasing magnetic field. So what you can see, so this is your start. You see we increase the magnetic field in different steps and you see domain walls are forming, moving through the sample um, and then um, when the switching is finished you again have a multi-domain state. So um, let me show this here again. These are the images from the movie and maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't, but again if you have a 0 millitesla and 150 millitesla, the domain state looks actually pretty, pretty similar. So the domain walls are where they were, but in the, in the middle we have actually domain walls moving through the sample. And to make it even more clear, I colored the different domains, what is happening. So again, we start, for example, if you look at this blue domain, we have a yellow domain coming in and forward and then moving outwards again and again again and then uh, the switching is complete so every so at the domain wall you you change the polarization and uh, first we thought it it might be something that is somehow carried by the domain wall that it kind of reverses the the polarization as well but you can also explain it in a different manner so you can explain it by a very uh, easy model where you say you have different domains um, so you switch magnetic domains, those are the ones that move through the sample, you observe a certain domain state and underneath you have an invariant domain state that sets the relative orientation of the magnetization, the polarization. So every time you have a domain wall, a magnetic domain moving through the sample, um, you reverse the magnetization but at the same time you need to reverse the polarization. And what is very nice so is that you can reverse an inhomogeneous field uh, domain distribution with a single field sweep. I'm not sure if this is useful for something, but it's somehow pretty cool. And uh, what I really like, recently came, um, ca a, a paper came out really explaining this on a, um, with the Landau theory approach and also with a, a microscopic model. This is the work done by, by Onda and, and um, Jonathan White and Michelle Kenselman, PSI, um, explaining the um, simultaneous switching in these cases. Um, and I didn't, didn't really say that this is quite a complicated order, so we actually have uh, a multi-Q phase again. So we have, a like this morning in a superconductor, but here in a multiferric material, we have an two incommensurate order parameters and two commensurate order parameters, describing different parts of the magnetic structure. Um, and this leads to this very complex term to the free energy. Um, so maybe let me explain it in a very dummy model. So we have a conical spin spiral, so I prepared this cone. As you can see, the moments are pointing towards you and just assume that they are rotating in a clockwise manner. So if I go here, we have spiral, so it's kind of a spiral in a clockwise manner. Um, what is happening now in this material is that you flip the cone the moments point in this direction and your rotation sense reversed. So you have a, now a counterclockwise spiral. This is then related to the handedness and the polarization. Um, actually, it's more complicated um, because you have different, different projections on different planes that give you the magnetization and the polarization. But this is kind of the <coughs> easy model to explain it. Um, uh, one thing that I find very intriguing is you see here the polarization is um, the difference of these two order parameters and the domain state that gives this uh, this this relative orientation is this um, the sum of it so 
you kind of have these different domains. So this is the domains that you cannot influence. There is no way to influence this. So, um, so if you have trilinear couplings in this way, you also need to somehow know what this domain state is doing. Um, and to conclude on this part of the talk, so we, we can inverse a multi-domain state with a single feed sweep. And there are other materials that have a similar coupling, where we also, also assume that it's somehow related to domain walls, but maybe it's rather this kind of coupling as well. And um, in, in various fields, and also in multiferics, there's also the discussion of using um, tri-linear couplings to create ferroelectric ferromagnets. But if you have such a trilinear coupling, you need to be sure that you also have the domain state of this kind of invariant um, um, domain state controlled, if you really want to make very good ferroelectric ferromagnets. Okay. Um. <laughs> the next topic I want to introduce you is um, boundaries, polarization control at multiferic domain walls. And I want to make a short detour on what um, actually um, inspired this work. And it's actually the <laughs> only part where I can really say topology, um, where I can say it shamelessly because it's about topology, uh, topological defects. Um, so topologi topological defects are the shards of broken symmetry. That is the title of this paper by Zurich. Um, and maybe you've seen this little hedgehog defect. Um, this is kind of the, the spin sphere. And um, you can describe topological defects um, by their homotopy groups. So this lucky loop with the line cannot really uh, catch the ball in a lasso. So it's kind of there are no line defects on this order parameter space, but you can somehow wrap it or put it in a, in a basket. And this means you can have point defects in this case. And topological defects in, in um, condensed matter systems has been um, described since quite some time. So there's this very nice review paper by Merman from the 70s, 80s. And there was a renewed interest around 2010 with the re-finding um, re of, of the interesting domain structures in hexagonal manganites. This was already known in the 60s, but then you rediscover it. Um, and what is interesting about hexagonal manganites is they are ferroelectrics, but you have a structural transition and um, the domains are, the ferroelectric domains are arranged in a very distinct pattern. So you always have this kind of six domains meeting in one point and they can either in, they can rotate in, in this direction or they can um, be arranged in a different way. So you have vortices in your material that can have a certain handedness. And the thing is you cannot destroy them, so you can either create them in pairs or destroy them in pairs, but alone they are protected. So this is a topological defect. And they can have interesting properties. Um, one way to use these topological defects is to um, attest the kibble zurich scenario, where um, if you, so this is, is the phase transition, and if you wait longer at the phase transition, your system can thermalize more effectively and you have lesser defects in the material. And then you can relate um, the, the quench time versus the defect density, and there's this, it's a power law and it has a certain exponent, and this exponent is universal. So there was also this connection to um, the universe and um, the Big Bang, th um, the expansion of, of um, the, how you say, inflation theory and the number of topological defects you have in the universe that you can test in a condensed matter system. So with, for this work, it's more interesting what actually, if you have these topological defects, your domain walls have to somehow connect these two defects and they have to do it in a very curved manner. And what was found in, in hexagonal manganites is that because you have these curved defects, um, you not only have side-by-side -side domain walls that are usually found in ferroelectric, but you also have head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail uh, -tail and head-to-head -head domain walls. And again, you have a charge accumulation, you have polar vectors, charges, 
um, that point towards at the domain wall and then you can get by the um, electrons or holes in your material a charge increase or decrease and then you can get um, a change in conductivity. So this is a conductive AFM measurement showing the conductivity on at these domain walls. And to go the back to the main story, polarization control and multiferic materials, it's again a, um, um, a collaboration. Um, so again, we have this um, head-to-head and tail-to-tail -tail domain walls and side-by-side -side domain walls in this hexagonal manganites, but we wondered what happened if you have a ferroelectric domain wall in a um, in a multiferric material and now rotate by using a magnetic field the ferroelectric polarization. And a material we, what we can use to um, um, investigate this is cobalt manganese tungstate. A manganese tungstate is a multiferric uh, material that has a critical temperature of 12 Kelvin, again at low temperatures. Um, and if we dope it with cobalt, we can get a continuous rotation of the polarization. So um, what I have here is uh, the solid lines um, are the polarization and dependence of the magnetic field. So at, at zero field, you have a polarization along B that reduces around four Tesla or three Tesla. <coughs> and then at the same time as this one goes down, you have an increase of the polarization along the direction A. And the dots are um, second harmonic generation experiments on different um, contributions where I can really trace where can be sensitive to different order parameters, PA and PB, in the same experiment. And this results in this continuous polarization rotation from B to almost A with applied magnetic field. So, um, first of all, we wanted to create a very nice two-domain state in our system. So, I first did electric field cooling to get a single domain state, and then I applied an electric field and uh, a constant field, and then we had domain nucleation, and the domain slowly moved through the samples. So I'll show you a movie about that. So we get some nucleation here, and the domain wall, this now in black, moves slowly through the sample. And it took some time, <laughs> and sometimes it jumps. <coughs> Um, but what you see is that the main part of the memory is actually uh, in the horizontal direction, so it prefers, again, the side-by-side -side domain boundaries. And once the boundary was somehow in the middle of the sample, I switched the field off, and this was my prepared domain state. And then we applied a magnetic field, rotated the polarization, so in, in each domain the polarization is done in the opposite direction, and we end up with a head-to-head -head domain state. And what happens with the domain, so with the domain structure itself, is nothing. I mean, it's kind of, um, it's a bit sad when you see nothing is happening in your experiment, but in this case it was quite interesting. Um, because we, we go, e electrically, we go from a side-by-side -side domain wall to a head-to-head -head domain wall, which is not so <laughs> favorable, but magnetically nothing happens. Um, and similar to this, there was also the, the publication by Sebastian Manz, and Masakatsu Matsubara showing a similar thing in turbiomanganite, that it's not a continuous rotation between those things, uh, with between those polarization, but rather a flop, so a sudden uh, reorientation of the polarization, but it's also done in a deterministic manner. And since it is a first order transition, it was always assumed that it's kind of random, but actually it's not because there is a certain torque associated to the uh, magnetic field. Um, so, um, what about the domain boundaries? What is happening there? Um, so as a reminder, we have this cycloidal spin spiral in manganese tongue state. We have a clockwise rotation that is corresponding to a certain polarization direction like minus P. And we have a counterclockwise rotation. Um, so these are the little spins. They rotate counterclockwise and it um, then induces a polarization plus P. Um, and in the following, I just um, I get rid of the spins in my um, in the following pages, just that um, the red and the blue side is just one polarization and the opposite polarization. And actually I prepared also a toy model of this. So uh, 
bit about that in a minute. So we did, um, so no, uh, we, I mean, um, Anders Bergman in Uppsala University did micromagnetic simulations. Um, and what he found is the lowest energy to create such a domain wall is actually a twist um, of the spin spiral. And it makes sense um, because, so the energy terms you have to think about is exchange and an isotropy. And we already see that the system, if we apply a field, it rotates anyhow. So this is already has a certain energy. And um, if you now twist it, you somehow, it's, it's uh, energetically uh, OK. Um, so at zero field, you have this kind of twist. Um, the, the micromagnetic simulations give you a certain thickness of the wall. It's about 10 nanometers. Um, and what is important is that you have a finite polarization within the wall. And again, within the wall, the polarization points um, along the, the A direction that is also favored in magnetic fields. And the B component goes from plus to minus. Um, at high field, you now, so actually what is happening is it, it within the domain, high field, you rotate this by 90 degrees, but at the same time, oh, sorry, so, so this is our one domain, other domain, and then you have the domain wall, you just rotate it by 90 degrees in one certain direction. Um, the electric, again, you have a go from pl plus PA to minus PA, you have again a finite polarization in the middle of the wall, um, and, and a certain profile of the polarization across the wall. Um, and this wall is a little bit thinner. Maybe it makes sense because you have more polarization, a higher polarization term. If you think about this twist, the same twist, now this was the easy thing where you can really twist the paper, but if you apply the same twist in different directions, um, again, the, the blue and the red are the different um, planes where you have clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. Um, you end up with different kinds of ferroelectric domain walls. So magnetically, they're kind of similar, but um, what, what is happening that the chirality and the polarization rotates in a different way. So you have a side-by-side -side Bloch wall, ferroelectric Bloch wall. Mm -hmm. You have side-by-side um, -side, um, ferroelectric Neal walls and the head-to-head Neal wall in looking in different directions. This is a certain assumption that you make um, that the magnetic structure is similar in all kinds of walls, even though you look in a different direction. And if you apply a field, you rotate, and then you can transform this kind of wall to this kind of wall, kind of in a continuous manner. And uh, another thing that is quite interesting is um, we now have, um, we have the degree of freedom to twist the wall in a, like this, or like that. Um, so this is not fixed. So in principle, if we now have, to, if we would introduce, okay, it doesn't really work here. But if we would introduce two domain walls, we can have two different situations that we have domain walls with the same twist, they won't merge. Or we have domain walls with opposite twist, where you kind of apply a magnetic field and they will merge. Um, so this is also kind of interesting because you could create um, ferroelectric domain states that are protected, that you cannot get rid off immediately. I think if you would apply a strong enough electric field, you probably would destroy it, but um, this, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. And uh, to conclude this part of the talk, um, we can control both position and polarization state um, at this multiferric domain wall. And we twist the domain wall, we have a finite polarization in the middle of the wall. Um, and um, we, can, we can really go from one kind of wall in the other in a continuous manner. And, uh, okay, what's next? Um, as you might have seen, okay, this is a very, very brief outlook. Spin spiral multiferroics. Um, one of the problems is they are all kind of low temperature materials in the order of, of 50K, or most of them are in the order of 50K or below. Um, but still, there are very interesting research questions associated to this. So they have this strong coupling between magnetic and electric um, polarization intrinsically. So um, one of the main questions is also to how to, what are the dynamics of the system? How are they related now? This was statically, static imaging, static switching. Um, what happens if we really do it fast? 
um, can we control them by, for example, um, using um, so-called electromagnons that are terahertz excitation with both electrical and magnetic um, signatures where you can pump in terahertz to excite your system or, or switch your system um, optically. Um, and of course, that is maybe more related to potential applications um, and possibly the, or probably the, the content of the following talks about type 1 multifrogs that I didn't talk about any, anything about at all, and thin films and heterostructures, and it's actually quite a very, very strong field and with many interesting ways to go. Um, and I want to acknowledge quite a number of people, and actually Manfred Fiebig and Dennis Meyer, um, that were kind of supervisors, or both, yeah, so that was my official supervisor, and Dennis actually um, was also supervisor in my, my thesis, um, and uh, the collaborators on the two, um, two projects I presented, and also um, uh, Pietro Ledano, Romanov Pizarev, um, Petra Becker and Ladislav Buhati for the influence I, they had on me on, on all the symmetry arguments and Martin, Carsten and Tim for the help and collaboration in the laboratory. And with this I want to conclude my talk. Um, Multiferic uh, magnetoelectrics allow for unique manipulation themes and cross control um, with very interesting potential applications and I gave two examples where we can um, use trilinear coupling to completely reverse a domain state um, in manganese germanite, and also how we can use uh, spin spirals, uh, domain walls to that have a magnetic twist. And with this, I thank you for your attention.